I'm recording as well. It looks as though I am. Right, welcome to everybody that's come on to our affiliate licensee orientation session. These sessions we designed some time ago so we can update our affiliates and provide them with information regarding occupational health and safety, provide them with business information, provide them with the latest updates in terms of what's happening in the health and safety world. We've been through a journey through um, the whole COVID thing. We've gone through the processes of looking at how to present online. We've looked at the training material. We've looked at the CETA accreditation process. We've gone through a number of elements which have been, I'm sure, very useful to individuals so that they're a little bit more equipped and able to do whatever it is that they need to be able to do. So what we're going to be doing this evening is we're going to be doing a presentation specifically on the subject of asbestos. And the reason I wanted to address this question of asbestos was that it's a subject which is not well known. And just fortuitously, our guest speaker came along and he indicated that he could speak on the subject. We had a little discussion, we discovered that he knows an enormous amount about the subject, and he is a subject matter specialist, and I'll in introduce him in a couple of minutes. I will then hand over to him, and he will continue with the presentation as we go. In the meantime, all I'm doing is I'm admitting people to the, uh, fr into the from the waiting room onto the, the platform so that they can watch the presentation as well. Currently, we have 29 people, and it's a really nice turnout for a Wednesday evening, so I just want to say to welcome, to everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. That's really cool. So everybody that's now registered, either previously or tonight, I'd like to just ask you to once again, just register on WhatsApp. If you wouldn't mind just taking your phone, WhatsApp me so that I know you are here and you can just send the word asbestos to me. And what we can do is obviously we can track and see who exactly is on the webinar at this stage. So if you wouldn't mind, you've got my number there, 082-920-8912, 082. 082-920-8912. Nine two zero eight nine one two. I can hear the first one coming in. Here we go. Thank you very much. And I find this a very easy thing to use. Now, just out of interest, those of you that are starting to use any of these platforms like Microsoft Teams or Zoom or Skype or anything like that, registering people on WhatsApp is fantastic. Because if you look here, you will see, maybe you can see it, maybe you can't, maybe it's too bright. There's the word yes. And what is so cool, if you use a keyword and people register with the keyword, you can type in and search every single person that is registered under the word asbestos. So by the end of the evening, all 30 participants or so, I'll be able to pick up quite quickly who they are, put them into a WhatsApp broadcast, not a WhatsApp group. WhatsApp groups irritate the pants of people, put them into a WhatsApp broadcast, and we can then negotiate, discuss, we can transact with these people, we can ask questions and so forth. So, for those of you that are coming on, please would you register via WhatsApp, you can hear the phone going bleep bleep, and then we'll be able to put you into a group and keep you informed of all of that. My number once again is 082-920-8912, that's 082-920-8912. Okay, so having said that, I want to quickly tell those of you that are new to the, in, the intro platform, the intro business, who we are, what we do. We started Intro about 15 years ago, Penny and I started the business, and our primary objective was to provide trainers with training materials so that they could run their own in-house training programs, whether it's a corporate program or in, in the instance of them being independents, where they could become affiliates. And we've got three basic affiliate programs. The Affiliate Basic, which is the entry level for a person, the individual who wants to start running training programs, and we now have over 30 training programs they can run some of which are unit standard aligned CETA accreditation bearing um, uh, courses and others are legal compliance course. Then the second one is the affiliate prime. And the thing that makes the affiliate prime the uh, one of the prime packages and we call it prime is that it includes the full entire process of CETA accreditation from start to finish with one of two CETAs, either the health and welfare CETA or the FP and M CETA. So we've set that up and you get the training material and so forth and so forth. And then the last one is for the corporates. So it's the multinationals, the government departments, the uh, universities and places like that. We call that the affiliate corporate. And that program is very specifically covers copyright. So which means we actually sell the copyright to the corporate. You'll see that we are FP and MC to accredited. We are SIOSH CPD accredited for our training material. And we're also members of IOSH, the International Occupational Safety and Health Association in the United Kingdom. So there's a little bit about us and who we are, and we're going to get straight into the program in a couple of minutes. So I got this phone call, we started chatting, and Wayne and I 
came up with this idea that he would do a presentation for us. He told me who he was, what he could do, and he just gave me a little bit of a background and I was absolutely blown away. His experience is vast, he's been around for a long time, he knows the subject very, very well, and we're really privileged to have Wayne on as our guest speaker this evening. He's the operations manager of FireMed, which is a C2 accredited training provider. He was in the fire services for over 16 years and he qualified as a hazmat technician and was involved in hazmat and the specialized handling of hazardous substances and asbestos removal and disposal and so forth. Wayne also worked for an AIA, which is Authorized Inspection Authority, an occupational hygienist who specialized in the area of asbestos and lead and a number of other hazards. So tonight, tonight he's going to share his lessons with us and he's going to be able to provide with us with a huge amount of information. And I really am looking forward to that. So Wayne, stand by. I'm going to hand over to you in a couple of minutes. But just before we end, I want to say to those of you that are coming in to please register. Really important that we know who you are so we can stay in touch with you. And we would like to be able to provide you with additional information and so forth. Before Wayne starts, I must tell you that FireMed have a full-blown asbestos training course, which Wayne will be talking about. And he will tell you about this training program, which you can attend with FireMed, that you don't do with IntraSafe, you do it with FireMed. And we'll put you in touch with them if you should wish to um, acquire additional qualifications and information and knowledge. This evening session is, in fact, a Section 8 Occupational Health and Safety Act information session. And those of you that are familiar with Section 8, it says that the employer must inform, instruct, train, and supervise. And tonight is a, it's a Section 8 session. There's no CPD points. There's no certificate that's going to come as a result of it. It's just general information so that our affiliates know what they're talking about. Okay, and then lastly, just to introduce you to the fact that our website contains most of the information about us, our products, our processes, our services, and so forth. And just to let you know, if you've just come on, that we're about to launch our e-learning platform, which is going to be a user pay shared facility for anybody who wants to either attend training programs on our user platform, or alternatively, if you happen to be in the training industry, you can send people onto this platform and we share the proceeds with you. So, okay, that takes me to the end. We've basically done all of that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop share and I'm going to hand over to Wayne. So Wayne, you should be sitting, standing by there. Excellent. Let's see where Wayne Thanks. is. Yeah. Right. Wayne, can we hear you? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and I can see you. So at this stage, what I'm going to do, Wayne, is I'm going to just quickly hand over to you. I need to find you on the list over here and make you the host. Uh, where's Wayne? Oh, no, you're not Wayne. You are. <laughs> it's FireMed. It's FireMed. We quickly find FireMed, yeah. I'm sure to find it. If I can't find it, I'm going to shout loud and hard. Uh, there we go. More. So, Wayne, over to you, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing with us. We really appreciate that. Over to you. There we go. Thank you. Okay, now, why can't I get you? Uh, when am I still on? Can you hear me still? Yeah, you've got you've got your slideshow on. I need to put my slideshow on. Okay, I think I've taken that off. Let's see if you can get yours on. And to all our guests that are sitting out there, I keep on saying to people, this is not a television studio. This is an information session. It's a bunch of friends. I've got, got to know so many people um, over the last couple of months. So they know we're not perfect. We're far from perfect. Um, the only one perfect is Penny, and she's not going to feature today. So over to you, Wayne. Let's see if we can get you up and running. <clears throat> and in the meantime, I can see Victor. Victor's come on. Nice to have you with us, Victor. That's absolutely fantastic. Shireen, hi. Nice to have you with us as well. You said you were going to be joining us. That's really great. Fantastic. And who else is here? I can see a couple of new names. There we go. We've got Ilsa with us, and Ilsa... Um, We'll get back to you towards the end. Okay, so once Wayne is finished, what will then happen is, there we go, Wayne's getting up and running. That looks fantastic. Um, Wayne will continue for an hour, then complete, and then we will do a question and answer sh session right at the end. So we'll switch off the recording and we'll be doing that. Okay, Wayne, over to you, my friend. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, yes, and I think you've introduced FireMed and myself. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Really appreciate it. So tonight, as you rightfully said, tonight's um, chat is about a 
and awareness on asbestos. And uh, <clears throat> yes, we do have a, a fully fledged course, all right, and it will be available on our e-learning platform very shortly. So anybody who wants any more information regarding asbestos, welcome to contact us. And then if I can kick off, because I know you've given me the hour, and you also said that you're an ex policeman and you've got a truncheon store in your back pocket and you're going to use it if I don't hurry. So yeah, we go. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So what is it all about? All right. Um, this is, please just note that this is just an awareness course, okay? Um, and that's it, all right? It's, it's purely for, for information only, okay? And our objectives, we're gonna discuss what is asbestos, asbestos and the human body, how it affects the human body, and then of course, managing asbestos in the workplace, and that'll cover a bit of the legislation as well. So what is asbestos? Asbestos is a mineral that is mined. Asbestos is a fibrous material, and it has some very unique characteristics that we will discuss a little later. Asbestos is classified as a hazardous substance. It is a known carcinogenic. The characteristics of asbestos, and this is why it was used predominantly in the industry, or multiple industries, by virtue of the fact that it has some very unique characteristics, there is no replacement material for it. Nothing has all of these characteristics. It is lightweight. It is a poor conductor of heat. It's a poor conductor of electricity. It doesn't burn. It only cinders at 1,980 degrees Celsius. The other thing is that when it cinders, um, if I can describe that to you, if you were to take a big tree and burn it, the outside will become charcoal and burnt and the inside core will remain wood because there's not enough oxygen with inside the timber to actually support combustion. So the outside chars and the inside is still wood. And this is what happens to asbestos, okay? It's a silica derivative. So what it will do, it will cinder and it will protect itself by turning the silica into glass. Now, if you look at tiger's eye, tiger's eye is brown asbestos that's just been polished up, that's gone through a volcanic episode, okay? Intense heat, and it's protected itself. But if you were to take tiger's eye and bust it open, it would be brown asbestos. It is chemically inert. So chemically inert, you can take one gram of asbestos and put it into a plastic solution and leave it there indefinitely, let's say a period of 10 years, take it out, weigh it, and it will be one gram of asbestos. You can take that same asbestos and put it into a uh, acid solution, sulfuric acid, 99% sulfuric acid, leave it for 10 years, take it out, weigh it, and it will weigh one gram. You can send it to the sun and back, and if you get it back and you weigh it, it'll weigh one gram. If you put it through a nuclear explosion, and you can gather it all back together again, it'll weigh one gram. It is chemically inert. It has excellent binding properties. So that's why they used it predominantly with cement. And that would be referred to as an asbestos containing material. They mixed it into cement to make cement light. Okay. And then give it all of the properties that are characterized in asbestos. It has good friction resistant properties. It was used in brakes and clutch pads. Uh, in the old days, you never replaced the clutch, never. It was made of asbestos, okay? You sold the car with 150,000 kilometers on with the original clutch in it, okay? Today, you're changing brake layers every 60 to 70,000 kilometers. Before, you didn't have to do it. They had asbestos in it. And of course, it was relatively cheap, okay? And definitely relatively cheap in comparison to other materials of the time. Uh, there are 14 types of asbestos on the planet, okay? And in South Africa, we used to mine three of them. Blue asbestos, brown asbestos, and white asbestos, chrysogelite, amosite, and chrysotile. And you can see them there in the picture on the left-hand side, the blue asbestos being at the bottom, the white asbestos being at the top, and the brown asbestos being in the middle. And that's a typical roof sheeting made from asbestos, gutters, especially used guys down at the coast, gutters were made from asbestos, okay? And brake pads and clutch pads 
gland packings, a number of other things. So if we have a look at, at white asbestos, white asbestos is probably the least harmful <laughs> um, in the sense that it is not very aerodynamic, okay? If you look at it under a microscope, it looks like a pubic hair, okay? That's the best description I can, I can, so it's not aerodynamic at all. It's very wavy and it doesn't travel easily through the air. But if you look at blue asbestos, which is the most dangerous asbestos, and you look at it very closely under a microscope, it looks like a steel cable. And when it breaks, that piece that breaks off, if you magnify it more, will look like a piece of a steel cable. They, they replicate their mother, if I can put it that way. So their source, they replicate. No matter how small they get, they will replicate their origin. Brown asbestos looks like the fibers of wood. So if you look at the wood grain, asbestos looks like that. And if you look at tiger's eye, you can see it quite clearly as well. Okay, to cut this nice and short, for the recording purposes, that's an interest slide. Mining in South Africa predominantly to place blue asbestos in the Northern Cape. So if you go to places like Kuruman and you're in that area, and you're riding along and you see the felt looks blue or that hill looks blue, stay away from it. That's blue asbestos, okay? Polokwane was brown asbestos. White asbestos was Barberton, Swaziland and Zimbabwe. They're still mining white asbestos in Zimbabwe and selling it to the Chinese. Be careful of Chinese products you buy into the workplace, okay? Especially gland packings and things like that. They might just contain asbestos. All of the Chinese stoves that you get the seal around the end of the stove, okay, contains asbestos. Mining was stopped in South Africa, and there's a current ban on mining of asbestos, the transportation of asbestos, the handling, use, and the installation of any new asbestos or asbestos-containing materials. To just differentiate between the two, one would be the fibrous raw asbestos and where you would use it, and the other one would be what we call an ACM, an asbestos containing material. So if we have a look at raw asbestos, obviously when it was mined, it's in its raw form. And then it was used as an insulation or gland packing, heat sealing material, and asbestos rope wrapped around the exhaust pipes, um, especially in generator rooms, boilers, that type of thing. Fireproofing material, old theatres in the old days were cladded with asbestos. The entire theatre was cladded with asbestos. Um, and then, of course, acoustic insulation. It's, it's a wonderful um, acoustic material. Okay, and then adjoining compound in older buildings. On the asbestos containing side, and the picture there shows a, and that's Mali tile, okay. So it was used in roof sheeting, cladding, fascia boards, windowsills, paneled heaters, the old cable heaters, asbestos heaters, wall-mounted heaters. Some of them are still asbestos. If you get them from China, they're asbestos. Um, and then, of course, um, gaskets. And if you look at the picture there, the brand name for it was Klinkerite. Um, anybody in the engineering or motor industry will know Klinkerite gasket all contains asbestos asbestos um, and then of course floor tiles now most of the old government buildings floor tiles still have asbestos in them by virtue of the fact that they haven't they they write the rules but don't apply to them um, so you go into an old hospital and you look at it the hospital's busy falling apart and the floor still looks great <laughs> it's because the floor is made of asbestos um, and then of course plasters they mixed it into plasters especially in laboratories where they worked with acids and fumes and stuff like that so the walls were plastered with an asbestos containing material mm -hmm. we talk about a low density or friable or high density acm uh, low density friable is when it's raw asbestos and if you have a look at the pictures there that would be typical installation around a boiler okay so these asbestos uh, materials were sprayed on or packed in and then closed up with, with um, cement. Okay, so these materials were used extensively between the 1940s and 1970s in buildings, particularly in North America and Europe. Um, fibers are most likely to be 
uh, released when this material is disturbed or when maintenance or renovation work takes place. So as soon as a boiler comes under um, any sort of scrutiny and it needs to be repaired or maintained, um, you've got to be very aware that although it looks like a block of cement, underneath that block of cement could very well be asbestos cladding. Most of it has been taken care of in, in industry today um, by virtue of the fact the boiler, the people who, who do refractories, refractories engineers are quite well aware of the hazards of asbestos because they used it to clad the boilers with. And then we talk about high density asbestos containing material and this would be typical of um, asbestos pot plants, roof sheeting, window sills, all of that where the asbestos was mixed with something. Okay, um, so it's a hard material generally, which the asbestos fibers are firmly embedded um, and are unlikely to be released during normal use. Examples include full tiles, asbestos cement products, and hard ceiling tiles. Um, fibers are mainly released from the products during sanding, grinding, cutting, um, work when somebody does an installation of a light switch or something and they cut into a prefabricated building that's made of asbestos, that's when you're going to get the release, drilling a hole to mount a wall picture or something. Now if you have a look at the pictures, the one on the left is the one in the center that's just being magnified and you can see the blue asbestos sticking through there. Now that was on a mine that I actually done an inventory on. Um, and there you can see typical, um, on the far right, you can see typically the um, asbestos roof sheeting. Hmm. Possibilities in your industry, insulation around high tension cables. Remember one of the properties of asbestos was the fact that it doesn't conduct electricity. So it was used extensively, especially in power plants. Okay, power plants today still have asbestos in them. Um, if you remember the old kettle, black and white cord, um, irons, black and white cord, that white cord that was in the black was asbestos. Okay, when you stripped it open, it had a, a white cable inside it that was asbestos. Insulation around hot water pipes, fire bricks, insulation for furnaces and boilers, asbestos containing materials, fascia boards, roof sheeting, soffits. Soffits are the bull noses over the ends of shops. Um, now, if anybody's got a picture of a checkers in their head, those black tiles surrounding all the old checkers, they were all asbestos. That was the soft fit. Uh, Molly style floor tiles, windowsills, prefabricated wall panels, and then obviously gland packings and, and the like. So if we have a look at the microscopy of asbestos and we look at it under a microscope, we're going to see that it will have quite a few unique characteristics as well. Now, a micron is one millimeter divided into one million equal pieces. Okay, and most respiratable asbestos fibers are invisible to the, the naked eye. You're not going to be able to see a respiratable fiber because the size is about three to 20 microns wide and can be as slim as 0.01 microns. A human hair ranges from sizes from about 17 mm -hmm. to about 180 microns. Okay, and any of this um, microscopy needs to be done by an AIA in accordance with the unit standard 39.4 under light microns. My cosmetry, <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> tongue tied there. Oh, okay, really? only, only fibers of five microns in length with an aspect ratio of three to one in diameter of less than three microns are counted. So, when we're counting asbestos, we don't count anything that's big, we only count the fibers that are respiratable. And if you have a look at uh, the effects on the human body and this is typical okay of somebody that suffers from a um, fibrosis of the lungs that fibrosis is going to end up in the fingernails clear sign that there's a fibrosis problem 
So if we have a look at routes of entry, there's obviously the inhalation and ingestion. So if we touch some, our food stuff or we put our hands in our mouth after we've touched asbestos, there's a possibility that it could enter up in our stomach. Um, and obviously, if you inhale the fibers, it's going to end up in your lungs. And normally it's accidental. Um, people who work with asbestos or touch asbestos and not knowing it's asbestos is normally through poor hygiene. They touch their faces and the asbestos enters into their, their system. Um, and smoking, eating, drinking is also obviously if you're exposed to asbestos, then you don't want to be smoking, eating or drinking in the area. Okay, and it cannot be absorbed through the skin. What it does do, however, if it does get into the skin, it causes warts. So the human body has a number of defense mechanisms and the cilia, the hair in our noses, is the first one that's there. So these are muscle operated. Okay, you've got to understand that these move backwards and forwards and that's why you'll feel sometimes your nose is tickle you because they're actually moving. Um, then, of course, the second line of defense is we have a 90 degree bend into our throats. Now, I'm sure it's happened to all of us. We've been talking and as you talk and inhale, something goes into your mouth and immediately you have a gag reflex and you cough. That's just your body defense mechanism so that you don't end up choking. In the alveoli, um, the, these cells have little scavenger characteristics, okay, and they dissolve unwanted um, materials, okay, and contaminants. Now, this will deal with most organic dusts and stuff like that. But remember what we said, one of the problems with asbestos is it's inert. So, the, this defense mechanism can do nothing to it. Mm. Um, and then, obviously, um, when this takes place, uh, there's a calcification process and white spots are visible on an x-ray on the lung. And we'll get into that as well. Like now, if we have a look at, at this year, so we should only be able to inhale anything that's smaller than 0.65 to 1.1 microns into the alveola. But you can see that this is gonna just get, as it gets smaller, so it gets deeper, deeper, deeper into the lung. Um, and obviously, the bigger it is, it's just going to get trapped in the nose. And when you blow your nose or your nose runs, it's going to come out. If we have a look at the, the alveoli, and uh, we've got to understand that these are elastic. Okay, they, they're very flexible. They need to move. And uh, our gas exchange takes place there. So we breathe in fresh or air and the gas exchange for oxygen and CO2, the byproduct, happens inside the alveoli. Now, if we start messing with these alveoli and we put asbestos in there, um, we, we end up with a disease known as asbestosis um, or lung cancer or mesothelioma normally fatal within one year. So if you diagnosed today with mesothelioma, if you make it to next year this time, you're doing pretty well. And I'm sure that your name could possibly end up in the Guinness Book of Records. Mm -hmm. Unproven, but possible cause of colon cancer. And obviously this is aggravated with smoking 25 to 50% higher risk. By virtue of the fact smoking is a, or nicotine is a, is a muscle relaxant, and what it does is it actually inhibits the body's defense mechanisms. Uh, remember what we said, the cilia, the hair in our noses are all muscle operated. And now you go and stimulate that with nicotine. It's a muscle relaxant. They go and relax and they can't do their jobs properly anymore. Plus you have a compromised um, respiratory system. So this is what uh, a piece, now that white needle shaped thing is, is a piece of asbestos. And there we can see the, the calcification around that, that asbestos. Um, so just to put it quite simply, what happens is um, the lungs will detect that there's something foreign in there. They send a WhatsApp message to the defense mechanism or the army, the white blood cells and say, hey, listen, we've got a foreign body that we can't deal with. They come along and they try and 
deal with it and realize, oh, nothing we've got in our arsenal takes care of this stuff. So let's just wrap it up, okay? We'll just package it. So it forms a calcification around that piece of asbestos. And they send a WhatsApp message back to the lung saying, everything's cool, we sorted it. Let us know if there's a problem. And a couple of weeks later, there's a problem and the same message goes backwards and forwards. Now it has the snowball effect. Remember that this is, is invisible to the, to the naked eye. So even on an X-ray, this can only show up when it becomes visible to, to the human eye. But then it's too late, okay? Because what has happened, this thing is just, that calcification, the asbestos has remained the same size. The calcification around the asbestos has just grown exponentially. It's like taking a pen and wrapping it with masking tape. Today, tomorrow, the next day, you're going to start off using half a roll, then a roll, then a boxer, and then eventually you're going to end up buying truck rolls of masking tape to wrap that pen up because it's going to be so enormous. And obviously then it can develop into lung cancer. And of course, like we said, people who smoke and work with asbestos or are exposed to asbestos have a 25 to 50% chance of, or greater chance of contracting any of the diseases. And in this picture, mesothelioma, if we have a look at it, the white spots on the outside of the ribs, okay? So what we're looking at is in that black area, you can see the white spots and that is typical asbestosis. Now, when it gets to that stage, it's way too big. Now, if you have a look at that, you can see there looks like a thing that is, it's a baby's hand and arm. That is mesothelioma. And what happens is the asbestos passes between the lung and it actually exits the lung and ends up in the pleura. So it grows laterally. Instead of 360 degree little ball, Okay, this thing grows rat laterally. So the calcification occurs much more rapid. Um, and there you can see that mesothelioma, that little hand is actually covered dart. Okay, so this guy's not, he hasn't got long. Um, managing asbestos in the workplace. Obviously, um, the owner of the asbestos, all right. So the property owner, and the employer are responsible for um, the whole asbestos thing. Okay, so obviously there's legislation and there's an asbestos regulation and they required that you do an inventory by the year 2001. And I think the cutoff date was August sometime in 2001. You had six months after the promulgation of the regulation to submit your inventory, which had to be done by an authorized inspection authority and submitted to the Department of Labor with a risk assessment, awareness training, and then of course, medical surveillance. Now it's not just your normal medical surveillance. Okay, if you have asbestos in your workplace, then these people need to do a chest X-ray and a lung function. Um, and then of course, you need to put in control measures and you have to monitor that asbestos for the re release of fibers every year. Okay, once again, that needs to be done by an AIA. And then, of course, there was the hierarchy of control. And the best thing was to eliminate all asbestos, and that was remove it from any workplace in its entirety. Um, that had to be done by somebody who was registered with the Department of Labor to actually handle asbestos. And then, of course, substitution. Well, that became very difficult because there are no real substitutions for asbestos. There's nothing that has all of the characteristics. However, um, ceilings are now have paper fibers in them instead of asbestos fibers. They're not as good. They don't last as long. And uh, as soon as they get a little bit of water on them, they rot. Okay. And then, of course, engineering controls. Um, and one of the things that, that they allowed was the encapsulation of an asbestos containing material with an epoxy. Now, <laughs> that just worked out so expensive, you might as well just have it removed and replace it. Okay, and then of course the administrative procedures, and if there was any asbestos in the workplace, or if you exposed anybody to asbestos, you had to issue them with the appropriate PPE, and of course train and make them aware on how to use that PPE. Um, <laughs> It falls under the OSH Act and the asbestos regulation. Okay, um, 
Regulation 155 of 2001-2002. Um, it is also classified under hazardous chemical substance regulation, the environmental regulation, um, construction regulations, facilities regulation, and then the Water Pollution Act. Mm. In, obviously, this was put in place, and by August 2001, um, certain things had to take place. Like I said, you needed to have submitted an inventory and your risk assessment on how you're going to deal with the asbestos and what your plan is going forward to remove the asbestos. Um, and this needs to be updated every 24 months to the Department of Labor as to the status of the asbestos that you own and what you intend doing with it and why you didn't follow your plan. And the inventory needed to indicate where the asbestos was, what type of asbestos it was, and how, many, how much there was. So any asbestos containing material was given in cubic meters, okay? And the same with any cladding was also given in cubic meters and then roughly a weight, all right? And then of course the type of asbestos, was it a fibrous material, was it an ACM, um, is it in, its condition, is it in poor condition, good condition? If you have a look at the valves in the picture, you can see that's cladding and they're not in good condition. Okay, that's exposing people to higher, very high concentrations of asbestos. And then of course you had to um, inform them what the possibility of the risk exposure was and what control measures you were going to put in place. The notification to the Department of Employment and Labor of the intention to do asbestos work and construction notification. So if you owned asbestos and you wanted to get rid of it, you had to submit a plan of work. Okay, and this plan of work needed to be approved by an AIA. Normally, they, when they facilitate that for you, they submit the plan of work to the Department of Labor. And of course, that... <laughs> takes some time to, to, to come back from the Department of Labor. But the, in the legislation, it says the Department of Labor have 30 days in which to respond. Otherwise, the plan of work is deemed as accepted. All right, so that's a very nice thing that, that's there. Then, of course, the, if you owned asbestos or you were exposed to asbestos in the workplace, the background monitoring prior any disassembly of the asbestos needed to be done. So before anybody touched the asbestos, we needed to have a um, background sample so that we knew where, where our measuring step was. That was basically the measuring step. Then of course, site establishment and like any construction site, all the necessary notifications and whatever you had to go up and everybody was going to work with the asbestos or be exposed to the asbestos needed a, a medical Obviously, they needed training and induction to the site. And then, of course, workman's compensation. Um, your, your staff that, that were um, going to do work for you, you had to notify COID that they are asbestos handlers, right? And then work can commence. The administrative control, okay. Uh, routine personal and environmental monitoring. So if you own or you expose any employers, employees, sorry, to asbestos, then you need to do, uh, if, if they're in direct contact with the asbestos, personal monitoring and then background samples of the environment. Yeah. This also needs to be done on completion of any work. Once all the waste is removed, remember now we have our measuring stick and during the process, this is all being monitored. And when everything's done and you want your clearance certificate, we need to then measure and see whether that measuring stick has actually gone into the negative. And then once a clearing, clearance certificate is, is done, um, the AIA can then give you a final um, clearance saying that there's no more asbestos on that site. If you're doing um, a partial cleanup or partial removal of the asbestos, the AIA will then issue you 
a certificate for that particular building or for that particular asbestos that you've removed. And obviously then it comes off of your inventory with the Department of Labor. And then of course you will get your final clearance certificate once there's a safe disposal certificate. And it is all done through an approved asbestos contractor. And then of course, like I said, um, your asbestos inventory gets updated and this passed on to the Department of um, Employment and Labor. Monitoring, uh, a monitoring is a program, not just of taking samples, okay? It includes planning, preparation, sample analysis, reporting, and management of asbestos projects. It's, it's a very intense um, operation in that if at any time during the operation, if the occupational exposure limit is exceeded and this is picked up, work is stopped, plan of work is revised, and once that's done and we can bring the levels down again, then we can commence with, with a continuation of removing asbestos. Okay, and of course planning is uh, when, where, what, how, and how long to sample. Sampling strategy, you need a sampling strategy, and as an employer or safety officer, you are part of that strategy because you need to put in any um, requirements regarding your staff during that operation. Um, then obviously it needs to be done by an AIA and in accordance with MBHS 39-4. And uh, like I said previously, only fibers under five microns in length with an aspect ratio of three to one in diameter, uh, less than three microns are counted. So if we have a look then, this is looking, this is a picture taken by the microscope. And if you see that little, it looks like a telescope site, that's called the Walton Beckett Graticule. Walton Beckett Graticule. And each one of those lines on the top going down are three microns and each one going um, horizontally are five microns. Uh, the little white spots that you see there, that's just dust particles. Now what you're looking at there is white asbestos. You see that looks like a pubic hair, okay? Now those are all way too big, all right? And you only count what is in the graticule, not what's outside of the graticule. But there is a danger one. There where it says five by five to three, there's a danger one, okay? So if that was inside of the graticule, it would have been counted as a respiratable fiber because it's less than five microns and it's thinner than 0.3 micron. Okay. So that, if that ended up in your lung, you would contract asbestosis. Mm -hmm. Okay. That one there as well. Mm -hmm. That's just bacteria growing on the slide. So sampling, um, the, it's portable sampling equipment and it has a constant flow rate one liter a minute for personal monitoring and two liters a minute for static monitoring. And obviously we're measuring the total weight average and it's over a four hour period, okay, at a flow rate of uh, two feet per millimeter, okay. So if we have a look at, at the occupation exposure limit, okay, monitoring, it's 10 liters a minute at, sorry, 10 minutes, four liters a minute at six feet per milliliter, okay? And obviously it's a homo homogenous selection of sampling, okay? So it, you just pick somebody and he gets the monitor on him. And there you can see in the pictures is a typical example of um, somebody working with asbestos and the little monitoring device attached to him and the um, uh, background sample is there on the fence. All right, so, and of course, quality control of sampling and analysis, analysis, okay, needs to be traceable. And 
conform to the national standard. Calibration of all equipment is a requirement. So if we have a look at counting, you need for personal samples, you need to count 100 fields. So you need to move that gratitude tool across the slide 100 times. And obviously what you're looking for, there is um, respiratable fibers, okay? And the picture on, on the right, that's fiberglass. Now you can see if fiberglass breaks off there, it will become a respiratable fiber and has the same, pro well, some of the same properties as asbestos, okay? Um, I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna shuffle along here, guys, okay? Waste management, obviously housekeeping, and it, all asbestos waste, all asbestos containing material needs to be double bagged, um, needs to be demarcated, demarcated and signed off. Asbestos waste bins or compactors need to be used for transport and not just, you can't just load it into anybody's truck and off you go. Um, and it must go to a registered waste site that must be able to deal with HH. That's highly hazardous waste material. And obviously from that waste disposal site, you want a safe disposal certificate and all records, medical staffing, doesn't matter what needs to be kept for 40 years. It's part of the legislation. And then of course, once all that's done, you will receive your um, clearance certificate and the revised inventory and risk assessment. Okay, so if we have a look, those are, that there's a big W, what big W roof sheeting, and it looks all fine. Those white spots on there are not bird poop. If you look at it magnified, that's the white asbestos peeping through there. The picture bottom left, blue asbestos containing material. Um, this was uh, a ship that was parked on the bricks just off the Namibian coast. It's a cable layer. And all the cladding, all the fireproofing, everything inside this ship, Okay, all the pipes, all the steam pipes, all the water pipes, everything were cladded with asbestos. That thing was a nightmare. And because it was laying on its sort of on its side, we had to build a deck so that we could land on the thing to actually commence work. Our first priority was obviously, of course, getting off all the crude oil. Uh, next priority, getting off all the asbestos. Now you do that <laughs> when that ship looks like that. Not a nice job. Guys, I'm going to hand you back to Ken. And if you've got any questions, please go ahead. Please feel free to ask me. And um, we'll be putting this up on our e-learning platform shortly as well. Um, and we're going to negotiate with Ken how we can do this as a joint venture through his um, e-learning platform as well. So you can have it on, on both networks. Wow, Wayne, that is absolutely fantastic. While you're doing that, would you please just make me the host again so we can get back to, there we go, I'm the host. And that was really, really interesting. Thank you. Uh, I mean, there's probably a dozen questions, so we've got a little bit of time. So if anybody would like to ask you questions right now, please go ahead. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourselves and ask the question, that'd be really cool. Let me just see how I can unmute everybody. I think okay, everybody I think can. You un yeah, you need to unmute everybody. You're the host. Okay, I'm the host. I'm looking to see where I can unmute them. Let's just quickly see. I think it has to be done almost individually. But well, I'm hoping that I can unmute. These are all new things that we're learning. And Diva, now technical guy, unfortunately, he lost the signal and we lost a couple of other people along the, the way. But we've still got 18 people here. So let me just quickly see how I can... Unmute, no. <laughs> now you've muted everybody.
No, he's muted himself. Just come and have a look here, Stan, and see. Ah, uh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Okay, so you can hear me. I can't hear you, but I should be able to unmute everybody else. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate that. Okay, a little bit of technical thing over here. That's fine. That's fine. For some reason. Can you just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yeah, you back as hosts and everything sorted. You muted yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm unmuted and you unmuted, which is fantastic. But all the other people are not. So um, we'll just see if we can quickly find out what the story is here. So if anybody has any questions, what you can do because WhatsApp is a glorious thing, so you can quickly WhatsApp the question to us, and I'll just repeat the question to Stanley while I'm having a look over here. Okay, anybody want to send me a message? Aaron, can you hear me clearly? I can hear you, Ken, and it uh, looks like you've unmuted everybody. Ah, there we, go, there we go. Okay. Now. Yes. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Back, back online. <laughs> so we lost a couple of people on, on route, but that's fine. Thanks, Darren, for confirming. Okay. First question for um, for Wayne. Wayne, thank you so much. So let's go with the first question. Anybody? Uh, yes, Ken. It's Nikki. Um, go right ahead, Nikki. What I would like to know is when you do foundation and the foundation is on clay, what is the fiber that they're using in that cement? Okay. I'm, I'm not a building engineer. Okay, so I would have no idea. But it, it's highly unlikely that if it's in modern South Africa today, that it would be asbestos by virtue of the fact that South Africa has a total value on asbestos. So for anybody to obtain of asbestos today would be a problem for them. So in that type of quantity to mix into, into um, to be highly unlikely. But a derivative of asbestos, if I can explain this to you this way, if um, appetizer is... Uh, well, if apple size is to great, what wine is to great, then vermiculite is to asbestos what um, apple tizer is. Okay, so vermiculite is also a derivative of asbestos. In the formation of asbestos during the process, vermiculite was formed and it never ever completed the process to actually become asbestos but it has very similar properties and it hasn't been banned. So it's possible in clay that they put in vermiculite into cement, okay? And this will absorb the, the moisture out of the clay because that's what vermiculite does. Hmm. Does that answer your question, Nikki? But I could be wrong. Like I say, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a civil engineer, so I wouldn't know, but it's possible. Okay, good one. That's something that we can obviously Google on and just if you wouldn't mind uh, having a look and seeing if you want to come back. Once again, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Wayne specifically, you can, you can feel free to WhatsApp us. Um, I must apologize, not exactly sure what I did in terms of muting and unmuting, but um, there we go. Um, here's a question. It says, how can you know when it new it's new tech or asbestos? How can you tell the difference? Okay, new all right. Everright made uh, all the asbestos roofing and 
window stalls and when obviously when asbestos was banned if um, they didn't change their operation they would have been out of business so they had a massive plant cleanup um, which actually I uh, <laughs> took part in that cleanup of the Everright Park close to Verenigen and uh, we removed all the asbestos and they put paper in now as a rule of thumb okay as a rule of thumb if you doubt that it's asbestos okay and not new tech you need to get an AIA to come and take a sample all right and if it's asbestos he will tell you it's asbestos if it's not asbestos he will tell you it's not asbestos all right I don't want to tell you how to do it because then I'm going to be exposing you to asbestos. <laughs> okay, I know how to do it, but I'm not going to tell you how to do it by virtue of the fact in order to do it, you need to break it and in breaking it, you're going to release fibers. And if you release asbestos fibers, you're going to contaminate yourself with asbestos. Mm. So, a, another rule of thumb, if the building was built after 2000, okay, highly unlikely, highly highly unlikely that there would be asbestos in any of the products used because by that stage asbestos had been banned and all the asbestos products removed off the shelf so if it's a building built after 2001 highly unlikely that there would be any asbestos in in that building any building preceding that however there's always the possibility another way of looking at it if you look at at ceiling board particular or fascias it's got the little golf ball marks at the back it looks like a golf ball from the back the new tech ones are big the asbestos ones are small just it's a rule of thumb it's not an accurate measure you need to break off a sample or you need to take a sample and you need to put it through a process by which you can identify yay or nay okay mm. and that must be done by an AIA Fantastic. I got another question over here from um, Nikki. She says vermiculite is being used in metal melting. How safe is it? Vermiculite hasn't been banned. So, yeah. <laughs> How safe is a McDonald's? <laughs> hasn't been okay. Banned. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. We, use oh. it in we use vermiculite in our gardens. Okay. It, it's hydroscopic. Vermiculite is hydroscopic, the same as asbestos, it's hydroscopic, so it'll absorb moisture. So that's why people use it in, in gardening, because you mix it in the soil and when it's got water, it absorbs the water. And when there's no water, it obviously releases the water and the plants have a better chance of surviving. Um, the charcoal bricks that you get in gas log fires, that log is made of vermiculite. Okay, so no problem with that. No problem. Ilsa, not sure if your microphone can be switched on. I do apologize, not sure why. You can't switch on as well. If you have any questions, Ilsa, that we'll happily um, pass that on. Uh, Darren, say the, Darren, the same with you, and Victor, same with you, and Thomas. So we've got six or seven people still left here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up the recording, and then obviously we'll make this available on YouTube. And I just want to, at this stage, say to Stanley, Stanley, thank you very much for um, facilitating this entire process. Thank you for setting um, uh, Wayne free so that he could do this presentation and all the preparation, because I know that you did quite a lot of preparation. So to Stanley and to Wayne um, from Fireman, I just want to say thank you very much. What I'll do is those of you that would like to attend the training program at some other stage with, um, with FireMed, please just send me a message on my WhatsApp number and I will then pass the message on to Wayne and on to Stanley and then they can follow up with you individually. For those of you that will be listening to the recording, my cell phone number or my WhatsApp number is 082 920 That's 082 920 And we look forward to having you at our next webinar. The next webinar is going to take place on the 21st, I believe it is. In fact, it's in two weeks' time on occupational health, and the subject matter that we're going to be addressing is ergonomics. Our speaker for that occasion is Dale Kennedy from Ergomax, and Dale is one of the very few ergonomists in South Africa. And I know that a couple of the people that were on here, Deline was on, she attended his five-day course, and she was just saying it's absolutely amazing, amazing course.
So at the same time, we'll also be releasing our ergonomics training material. Um, it's not a unit standard aligned course. There is no unit standard for uh, general ergonomics at this stage. So it'll come with facilitator guide, and learner guide, and PowerPoints and so forth. And when we, when they eventually write a unit standard for it, we'll unit standard align the training material. So at this stage, a little bit of an advert from my side. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Wayne, to you and Stanley, thank you. You guys have done a great job. If anybody that's still on would like to send a message to Wayne just in terms of the uh, contribution that he's made, please send me a WhatsApp message and I'll pass it to you. And at this stage, I'm going to stop the recording and then we can just take questions as we, as we go. So from Ken and Penny at IntraSafe, thank you very much. See you at the next webinar.